안녕하십니까? Nicolas Emira. In today's video, I would like to give you a tiny introduction to the core concepts of object-oriented programming, the way I would have liked to learn them when I was learning to code. Object-oriented programming is a programming paradigm, which is basically a way of organizing your code, a way of thinking and structuring your data. It is actually very, very popular because some of the most dominant programming languages like C Sharp and Java that have huge communities and very big enterprise adoption are object-oriented languages. And it's even more popular because programming languages like JavaScript and Python that are not specifically object-oriented support most of the object-oriented features required to write object-oriented code. This means that if you learn how to do object-oriented programming or OOP, you are going to be able to transfer your skills to a wide array of languages. You can move from Java to TypeScript and C Sharp very, very easy. I would say that learning OOP is very, very easy because humans intuitively think in an object-oriented way. You will see what that means by the end of this video, I promise. So let's get started. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna pretend that we are going to create a video game. If we're creating a video game, we would need to create a player object. This player object is the one that is going to hold the data of our players. And in JavaScript code, it could look something like this. Creating players like this, it's okay when we only have to create one player. The problem happens when this number starts to grow. When we have more players, as you can see, we can see some patterns starting to emerge, but also some issues. The patterns are that, for example, as you can see, these players all share the same properties. They all have name, health, and skill. The only difference between them is the data. The issue here, as you can see, is that there is nobody telling us that we should have a specific shape of what makes up a player. We could make a mistake when we are creating a player and we might forget to add skills to one player or we might misspell a property and those misspelling errors might be very hard to catch. For example, somewhere in this code, I put some silly spelling mistakes that I am 100% going to make and they will be very, very hard to find at a first glance. Another problem of duplicating code and creating players in this way is the fact that if, for example, I want to create a new property, let's say experience points, and I want to add experience points to all my players, I will have to search in my code for all the player objects that I created and I will have to add the experience points property one by one. That does not sound like a good idea. A better idea would be to have a player factory, some function or something where I can just input some data and I can receive a player object as output. This means that I wouldn't have to duplicate so much code and I will minimize spelling mistakes. Also, this means that if we wanted to add the experience points property to all our players, I just have to modify one place and that is the player factory. If I modify the player factory, then all the players will be updated as well. And this is when I want to introduce the cornerstone of OOP and that is the concept of classes. Classes allow us to create factories for objects that have the same properties, but different data. Classes allow us to define a shape, a blueprint of how our player object should look like. Now, the code examples on this video are on JavaScript and Python. If you don't know JavaScript or Python and you want to learn to code for free with me, with subtitles in Hangugo, then please click the link below. There you will find an eight hour free JavaScript course and a five hour free Python course that I'm going to update very, very soon. Please check out the link below. If you already know JavaScript and Python, but you want to learn things like React.js, React Native, Go, Redux, GraphQL for free, click the link below because we have courses on those things as well. Using classes, our code will look something like this. Now, don't worry, we're going to see what constructor and init means and does later. For now, let's focus on the result. Let's focus on how beautiful and easy the code becomes when we want to create new players. As we can see, we don't have to copy paste as much as before. And just like if we were talking about objects, we can access their properties as well. As you can see, the player class is a blueprint, is a mold, is the factory that allows us to create player objects that all have the same properties but different data. You can think of classes like cookie cutters. They are the template that we use to mold our data in whatever shape we want. When we use a class, like for example, when we create an Elon using the player cookie cutter, we refer to Elon as an instance or an object of the player class. 
instances or objects are the cookies that we get after we use the cookie cutter. But let's go back to the code and now see that in the JavaScript class, there is something called constructor and in the Python class, there is something called init. These things are normal functions, as you can see, but because they are inside of classes, we don't call them functions, we call them methods instead. The constructor and the init methods are called automatically by JavaScript and Python when we create a new object from a class. In the constructor method is where you can choose how to construct your class. What properties is it going to have? As you can see, our constructor methods take arguments, just like a function does. This is why I can say new player, and then I write Elon Musk, which will be the first argument, which will be the name of the player. Then I write the health, and then I write the skill. But also, as you can see, we can choose to program all our players to always start their experience points on zero. The word this or self is how we can refer to properties and methods inside of the player class. And it's very easy to read as well. We can say that this player has a property called XP for experience points and its initial value is zero. So far, as you can see, classes are pretty cool. They allow us to create factories or cookie cutters for objects with the same shapes. We also saw that classes have methods inside of them and methods are the thing that take classes to the next level. Apart from the constructor and init method, a class could have as many methods as we need. For example, we can create a method to teach our players to say hello. Now all the objects created using the player class will be able to call the say hello method. Or if we were creating a combat game, for example, we could create a method to program what happens when a player takes a hit. As you can see, methods make our classes way smarter than before. Before we were using classes to just organize data, but now with methods, we can specify interfaces of how to manipulate and how to read data. To finish this intro, let's take a look at a very important OOP concept called inheritance. Inheritance allows us to reduce code duplication and divide our code in many reusable pieces. In the offline world, inheritance happens when the parents die and the kids get all their money. In the object-oriented world, nobody dies, but the child classes get all the properties of the father classes. If we were making a game like The Sims, for example, which is a people simulator, we would need to start with a class for a human. But we would also need a baby class that is a human, that is cute and knows how to cry. And maybe we need a teenager class that is a human and that knows how to curse. As you can see, there is some code duplication going on here. Even though all the classes are a little bit different, they all share the fact that they are all human. They all have a name, two arms and two legs. And this is when inheritance comes into play. Instead of writing down this, that name, this, that arms and this, that legs in every class that we create, we can instead extend from a class that has this, that name, this, that arms and this, that legs and that class is human. So the code would look something like this. When we say that the baby class or the teenager class extend from human, what we are saying is that we want baby and teenager to have all the properties that human has plus their own properties as well. So this means that a baby instance will have a name, legs and arms, it will also be cute and it will know how to cry. But this code doesn't really work yet. And the reason why it doesn't work yet is because if we think about it, the human constructor is the one that sets the name of the human according to the constructor arguments. But we are not creating humans directly. Instead, we are creating babies and teenagers. To call the constructor method of the human class from the baby and teenager classes, we have to call the super method from the constructor of the baby and teenager classes and everything will work well. And that's it for this video. As you can see, the way we model our data, the way we access it and the way we manipulate it in the object-oriented programming world is very comfortable. And I hope that by now you can see why OOP is so popular and why so many people like it. This is not all, of course. This is just a tiny introduction to OOP and these are the concepts that I think you are going to be able to use everywhere across any OOP programming language. After this, if you want to dive deeper into OOP, you need to learn about private, public and protected methods and properties. You also need to learn what are abstract classes, static methods, and it will be very useful to learn what interfaces do as well. 
I on purpose did not want to use words like abstraction, encapsulation, and polymorphism in this video because I wanted to focus more on the practical aspect of OOP and how it can improve our code. If you would like me to do a more theory video of OOP, then please let me know in the comments. I'm going to be looking at them right now. And also, if you are waiting for the second video of the functional programming series, don't worry because it's coming as well. I wanted to make this OOP video first because we're going to be comparing functional programming with OOP a lot. So we have to basically know the enemy first. Thank you. Stay happy. Stay free. It's Ninji. Kamsamnida. Sarangheyo. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.